Hello and welcome to episode 104 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Paradin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the fast attack submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. Aside from Bill and I, we have a special guest today, and I will let Captain Toady introduce our guest and our topic for today. Bill? Thanks, Seth. Today, we're going to unpack the story of Admiral Chester Nimitz, who I believe to be the key leader for the Allied victory in the Pacific Theater of Operations. And to help us tell this story, we are honored to have a distinguished visitor, former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, or SACUR, retired Admiral James Stavridis. Now, I've known Admiral Stavridis since we were both midshipmen at Annapolis. I was a lowly plebe, and he was Brigade Operations Officer. Decades later, I worked for Admiral Stavridis on the Navy staff in an organization called Deep Blue the months immediately following 9-11. Deep Blue operated very similar to Nimitz's own wartime planning cell in Pearl Harbor. Admiral Stavridis is the perfect guest for us today, having written a chapter about Nimitz in his 2019 book, Sailing True North. Admiral, thank you for joining us here today. Uh, my pleasure to be with both of you, and um, I, I always begin uh, when when I talk about Nimitz with uh, my first class cruise at Annapolis, which was on board the then brand new aircraft carrier, the Nimitz. And uh, in preparation for going down for that cruise, and you'll appreciate this, Bill, I was in a debate about whether to go nuclear power or not. Mm -hmm. um, I knew I wanted to be a surface officer, but in those days, you could make a pretty strong case about the, the coming preeminence of nuclear power in the surface Navy. The thought was that we would build all these nuclear cruisers, nuclear destroyers, uh, gas turbines overtook that, and, and the world turned out differently. Uh, but I was very much in that debate, so I uh, packed my sea bag and went down and met the Nimitz in uh, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, long wow. before there were detainees there. There were midshipmen being imprisoned on the <laughs> aircraft carrier Nimitz. And uh, it was a wonderful cruise. It, it convinced me I didn't want to become uh, nuclear trained. I probably didn't have the personality for that. But um, everywhere I went on that ship, you, you really felt the spirit of Fleet Admiral Nimitz, Chester Nimitz, in in everything from uh, the then brand new innovation that you saw everywhere to the, the kind of confidence of the crew. Um, obviously the aircraft carrier, although he never served in one, um, but he was arguably the greatest proponent for this idea of using carrier air. And it was of course central to winning the war in the Pacific. Um, and he was the strategic commander, if you will, for the probably most pivotal battle of the war, the Battle of Midway, um, which was all about two carrier forces going at each other. So um, as I had my indoctrination on the uh, on the carrier Nimitz, um, I, I felt very much his presence around me and learned a lot about Nimitz. I was probably 20 years old at the time, and now I'm in my 60s. And I, I will tell you quite sincerely, um, every point in my career where I hit something hard uh, and had to think, what do I want to do here? I would think about, well, what would Nimitz have done? Truly. Mm. And, and there is no better icon, in my view, for any officer in our Navy than the Admiral's you, Admiral. You use the, the word in innovator, and boy, that's a perfect word to describe him. He was a submariner. But his innovation in the submarine force um, led the transition from gasoline submarines, which were very dangerous, to diesel-powered submarines. In fact, he lost his ring finger on his left hand. His Naval Academy class ring saved a bit of his ring finger, uh, working on diesel, sub diesel engines for submarines. And, and as you indicated, he was an innovator in carrier warfare. And the irony of that is here's the submariner and of course, his boss was Admiral King, who was um, Com Inch, Commander-in-Chief of United States Fleet and CNO eventually. 
And Calm Inch was a pilot, was an aviator. And, and King uh, repeatedly tried to get Nimitz to use battleships when Nimitz said, no, 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 I got to hold those back. They use too much fuel. They're not fast enough. We, the carrier is the way to go. Yeah. And even despite the fact he wasn't an aviator. Indeed. And, you know, by the way, as a destroyer officer myself, I, I, I will gladly lay at least partial claim to Chester Nimitz. Certainly he was a submariner, but as you know, Bill and Seth, he commanded a cruiser. He commanded a destroyer. Famously, by the way, he ran his very first command at sea aground the ground, right, in the Philippines, uh, when he was a lieutenant in command of, of some beat up old destroyer. I, I think it was maybe not even a lieutenant at that point. Yeah, I think it was um, an ensign. I think he was an ensign. Yeah. And, and he was reprimanded. He was court-martialed. Court he was right. reprimanded. But he went on to command uh, many surface ships. Um, so um, in the surface Navy, we like to feel like we have a little piece of Chester Nimitz. Um, although I, I freely grant you, if you asked him, he would say, I'm a submariner. And well, I, wore dolphins, I think he wore so. the dolphins. Right, he wore <laughs> exactly. the dolphins. But of course, Bill, in those days, we didn't have the SWO, SWO insignia. Yeah. So it wasn't really an option for him. Who knows no. what he might have worn had there he, been an he option. spent more time in command of cruisers. By the way, he did build Correct. submarine base Pearl Harbor. He commanded the Chicago. He, he commanded um, Battleship Division One. Right. Yep. embarked in Arizona. In by Arizona. The way. Yep. Right, which of course was sunk when yeah. he took command of the fleet. Let me go back to the innovation point because I think you hit two out of the three, which is to say his approach to using submarines, really unrestricted warfare and the and the transition in the propulsion systems, which by the way, of course, is echoed late in his career when he becomes the, the most senior proponent for Hyman Rickover's crazy idea of nuclear power. Yeah, let's build a miniature nuclear power plant, put it in a steel tube and send it hundreds of feet deep in the ocean. Hmm. It was Nimitz who got that across the breakers right. alongside the brilliance of Rickover, quite a pair. In any event, I wanted to underline one other big innovation and it, it became seminal in the war and it was underway refueling. Exactly. The idea of doing what in Navy parlance are called unreps, underway refueling, where you pull a ship alongside a source of fuel ship and you put hoses across. You know, it sounds, you know, kind of trivial. A, it's really hard to do, especially when you're figuring out how to do it, because huge masses cutting through water tend to uh, are attracted to each other. Venturi effect, that kind of thing. Um, and um, you have to invent all the equipment to pipe it and to flow it and to plug it in and receptacles. Uh, Nimitz really drove that and it enabled the, the ability to move these massive fleets at scale in ways that um, heretofore had been very, very difficult to do. So yeah, innovator, I, I think of him historically as um, akin to Sir Jackie Fisher um, the great British innovator admiral from the turn of that century. Um, I think Nimitz just is a is a marvelous follow on in the American Navy to Jackie Fisher in that regard, without any of the histrionics and flamboyance and uh, kind of, um, ex shall we say, excessive charisma of Jackie Fisher. Nimitz was calm, cool. Hey, have you thought about doing this? That's the kind of innovator to be, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one of the things that Nimitz excelled at was management of large personalities, mm -hmm. and I like to point out that Eisenhower only had to deal with the large personalities of Montgomery and Patton, whereas when you look at Nimitz, he had to deal with King, right? When <laughs> when war starts, they call for the sons of bitches, which right. is his. Yeah, you know, it's unclear whether he actually said that. But when somebody asked him if he said that, he says, sounds like something I would have said. Um, <laughs> he had to deal with uh, with Turner, terrible Turner, with Howland Hall Mad Smith. With Halsey. Halsey. Paul Halsey. Um, Admiral Towers, which is the head of aviation in those days. General Richardson, the Army commander in the Pacific. And the personality of all personalities, Douglas MacArthur. Yep. And somehow... 
he, I wouldn't say he kept the, the cats herded, but somehow he deconflicted all of these. Yeah. And, and was that, do you think that was a skill he learned while with all the time he spent at Bunav or was that just mm. kind of ingrained in his personality? I think it's more personality driven. And, um, you know, if you, if you study his, his roots and you, you think about him growing up on this, you know, kind of hard scrabble Texas world, um, he's multilingual, um, fluent in German. Uh, and, you know, he, he, he comes out of a kind of a laconic, Texas kind of style. I want to say his uh, grandfather was a Texas Ranger, uh, possibly his father. I forget which one. His grandfather was a former German uh, yeah. sailor in the merchant right. navy, and and I one of the two had been a Texas Ranger at some point. So you know, it's that great line about Texas Rangers. You know this story, Bill. When there's um, there's a riot going on in some western city in Texas in the 1870s, and the, the mayor cables the governor and says, you know, send, send me the Texas Rangers. My city is in a complete state of chaos and riot, and the train pulls in, and one Texas Ranger has arrived. And the mayor frantically cables and says, where's the rest of the Rangers? And the answer he gets is, one riot one ranger and and it's that it's that kind of um kind of serene uh piece i i mentioned to you earlier by the way i'm i'm actually deep into this at the moment writing a novel that follows an american naval officer from his beginnings in key west florida off to the naval academy in the late 30s and then his first assignment is um uss west virginia the battleship at pearl harbor and deep in the novel, he has an opportunity to go and, and sit as a backbencher during a briefing of Chester Nimitz. This is in 43, 44 by this mm -hmm. time. And um, my character comes out of that meeting and he's saying to himself, what did I see? What did I, what's the word that captures Nimitz? And the light goes on for him and he says, it's serene. Nimitz was serene. He was mm -hmm. calm. He was steady. Um, he wasn't swinging for the fences. And, and I think that calmness and, and the attendant virtue of subliminating his own ego allowed him to work with that incredible cast of characters that you rightly point out. You know who else had that quality, although he was not serene, but really of that era who could likewise work with the very disparate personalities was the president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Here at his level, he's dealing with Charles de Gaulle, Joseph right. Stalin, Winston Churchill, and he's got all these wackadoodle subordinates like Ernest King. Um, and, and so he's at the very top tier of diplomacy and governance, and also dealing with these massive egos and these five-star admiral and generals who've been created. He got some pretty good help in that regard, obviously from Leahy and Marshall, who were kind of, mm -hmm. you know, the no drama Obama types of that era. But there was a lot of craziness bubbling around in the, in the military ranks and all those diplomats. And Roosevelt could handle that as well. And I, I think in two very different ways of doing it, but uh, our subject today, Nimitz, I think it's that calmness that Texas kind of let's put this in perspective and, and not needing to be the smartest person in the room. Um, he's also, by the way, uh, famously an, an extraordinary delegator, someone who is, and it gets back to that. Um, he trusted really, his staff. Exactly. Right. Um, and, and, and here I'm reminded of a, a line um, Don Rumsfeld taught me when I was his senior military assistant as a three star. And Rumsfeld would always say, um, A's hire A's, B's hire C's, meaning really good people are unafraid to have really smart people around them to delegate to them to let subordinates shine. Whereas 
when you click back, Bs higher Cs, meaning people who are less confident, who are less secure in themselves, they want people around them who are more diminished, that they can dominate. Yes, ma'am. Nimitz clearly is an A willing to hire A's. Well, that and was I, um, Eisenhower worked for um, MacArthur as a major when MacArthur was in the Philippines. And when Eisenhower was a, a, a co four star, four star in the European theater, looking at who uh, MacArthur had promoted to his deputy, he said, he's hiring those boot bootlickers again. <laughs> and that's a kind of the quote. And, and that was, and we're not high on MacArthur, just so you know. And that's my no. view of a B hiring a C. Sutherland. Yeah. But go ahead, no, you were going to say something. Perfect. No, perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, Seth, were you going to chime in there? I was. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that 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 serenity of leadership that he had, that that the way that he conducted himself was literally what the doctor ordered post December 7th. You know, I mean, this is when he comes into the into the realm of, you know, sync pack. He comes in there. Of course, he takes command on the, what, the 31st yep. of December and uh, the New Year's Eve. And but he's exactly what they needed. And by they, I mean the entire Pacific theater. He's exactly what they needed. They needed that that serene, stable, genial gentlemanly leadership they didn't need the the as he liked to call them the blood and thunder the guys who would beat on the desk and scream and holler and cuss and wail and yeah make a scene he you know he was the exact opposite of that and you know he inherited a command that was devastated he inherited a command that was devastated in terms of morale uh ships people uh, supplies. I mean, you talked about underway replenishment, which, you know, was vital to anything that he and the Navy wanted to do in the Pacific theater. They didn't, they had two oilers, two in the entire Pacific fleet when he inherited that command. So he was the guy that, that, that needed to be in the, he was the right guy in the right place at the right time. Yeah, and, I think that's absolutely correct. And, and I think another aspect to what he then did was quite significant uh, because back to the your comment, blood and the thunder, I think a lot of commanders would have said, fire everybody. I want everyone yep. who was anywhere near right. this out of here right now. Um, and, and you can understand why sure. someone might take that approach. He did exactly the opposite. He said specifically of Admiral Husband Kimmel, could have happened to anybody. And right. I think that's right. Could have um, happened to him. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and Nimitz knew that, and and he also wanted to, to to rebuild that morale, have the continuity in place. Very very smart in that regard. And um, lastly, and then Bill, I want to share with you our reactions, yours and mine, after 9/11, because I think there's some parallels there, frankly. Um, but in terms of Nimitz. Um, what he does in that moment, by the way, is take command of this fleet, what's left of it, standing on the deck of a diesel submarine. Pretty remarkable mm -hmm. symbol of, okay, we're mm -hmm. just going to get this done with what we have. Pretty, mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Bill, yeah. I want to, I want to pick up on this thread and just, uh, you and I were both in the Pentagon. Um, in the section of the building that was hit by the aircraft. We did what we could. We stumbled into the field uh, when the first responders showed up and you and I were both at work the next day um, trying to put pieces together. You were, I think, a captain then. I was That's a right. star, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think we were both brand new in those ranks. That's right. Um, and uh, And then you and I got thrown together to create this thing called Deep Blue. Mm -hmm. um, say a little bit about that. And, and, you know, starting with what was it like for you? And I'll tell you what it felt like for me to be walking around the Pentagon as it smelled of smoke and jet fuel. And you can still see the, the, the smoke hanging in the air in places. Well, of course, we, we had already known that the two towers had been hit. And then we heard the plane coming in uh, before it hit us too. And, you know, I think like you, I knew in that moment that this was our Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And I knew that we were going to be, you know, in the military expression, we were going to be knocked down to parade rest and we we're going to have to recover somehow. And, um, you know, we both did what we needed to do on that day to, to help. And frankly, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. Yeah. As I said, the, 
everybody who was saved was saved in the first 20, 30 minutes by first by people who were on the scene at right. the time. And by the time professional rescuers got there, there was no one left to be saved. Yeah. And, you know, I think that on 912, it was, um, you know, because now what, where do we move from here? And I thought of this as Nimitz looking at the yeah. fleet that was still burning. Mm -hmm. and, and so the Pentagon was still burning. And I had served on the joint staff in a prior tour. And I was aware that the Air Force had something that we in the Navy did not, an organization called Checkmate, who worked on operational plans for the chief of staff of the Air Force. And so, you know, I proposed to Admiral Tim Keating, who you know very well, um, who was the N3 and 5 at the time, that we should have something equivalent, which was, you know, we hadn't, we didn't call it deep blue yet, but um, something that would help the CNO with a Navy at war, not just staff work, but a Navy at war. And so that, that was kind of the idea. And you showed up and kind of made everything work. And that was wonderful. <laughs> well, you're, you're too kind by far. I would say that we were lucky to assemble a pretty remarkable group of, of really about 15 people, I think, That's um, right. including you and a number of others. And, and by the way, you, you perhaps don't know this, but the junior member of that crowd, um, Lieutenant Matt Duffy, is now in the Pentagon as a full captain, post major command, and I think has a very good shot at making a rear admiral. Um, he he has a remarkable career going, um, and you know it just it, it, in that through line of command, um, it, it's just worth thinking about all the things we were each able to do in our careers after. Yeah. I, I do want to just go back to how I felt that that day or two after. I was I was angry. I was deeply angry, almost uncontrollably angry and I'm not you know me very mm -hmm. well I'm not an angry person I've no. not raised my voice in my by the way your personality is very much like Nimitz's who I would this is a good fit for today's discussion well, but go thank ahead. you that's very kind um and, and and yet I was shaking angry and 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 I'm, I'm I still remain astounded by Nimitz in that moment and how he was able to project this sense that it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, you know, that was his gift, his gift to the Navy, to the nation, um, and to those of us who have followed him over the years. Absolutely. Seth, do you remember what he said to the reporters right after he took command? Uh, no, I admittedly, no, off the top yeah, of my head, so I do not. It was, it was something very, it was, he did not overstate Right. So he didn't say he yes. Did. He didn't do the bull Halsey thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, yeah. you know Tokyo, the, you yeah. know, the bull Halsey. More done with them. The Japanese language will only be spoken, only in, be hell. spoken in hell. Right. <laughs> what he said was, we're going to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, it was exactly. Yeah. <laughs> typical. But, it, it, two, other, typical Nimitz, so. two other mm -hmm. points I want to uh, make about the Admiral, the fleet Admiral, excuse me. Um, one is his gift for friendship. And we mm. sort of alluded to this in terms of, you know, he could work well with all these people, but there was another level um, of his, his genuine affection uh, for many of his friends and peers. And, and the, the thing I, I love to quote in this regard, he and three of his fellow Admiralty members uh, decided they would be buried together with yep. their wives, all eight of them. And I'm, I, I know it was Nimitz. I know Spruance, it was Spruins. It was uh, Turner and Lockwood, I think, right. if, mm -hmm. if I get right. that right. Mm -hmm. And they're buried together. I visited his grave and saw the graves of, of the other three admirals and their wives. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, beautiful view out over the Pacific. Um, this was a big part of him, his gift for friendship. And the, the other thing we talked about is innovation and, and his qualities of pure leadership. He was also an instinctive educator. He was someone who loved to, um, in, in very gracious, thoughtful ways, express his ideas. He wrote articles for proceedings at, at every rank as, as you and I both have, Bill. Um, he was someone who, 
I think founded the NROTC unit at Berkeley. Berkeley, if yes. I'm not, right. not That's mistaken. Correct. And I know that because I was asked um, three, four years ago to give the Nimitz lecture at Berkeley, which was a big honor. And there were, you know, like a thousand people there. Um, he's still very much revered on that campus as an as an educator. And and then um, I think you know this, Bill, and, and Seth might as well, but the classic sort of broad history of the, of the U.S. Navy, of course, is sea power hmm. by E.B. Potter. The first edition of that was jointly written by E.B. Potter and Chester Nimitz. I still have my copy. I do too. <laughs> but I mine's not too. signed by, we both had Professor Potter for yeah. our sea power class, but mine isn't signed by him. I, did, I wasn't smart enough to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, they're not making that signature anymore. So you're no, going they to aren't. live yeah, without aren't. it. I'll yeah. tell you what I would love to have is just a signed document by Nimitz. I'm going to do some work on that. It can't be that hard to track that down. By the way, one of my classmates at Annapolis was the great nephew of Nimitz, a guy named Steve Nimitz. And you can imagine what his uh, plebe summer was like. No. You know, you know, oh. yeah, bad. <laughs> bad. Uh, you know, there's a, a special place in the hell of hazing reserved for the kids of admirals. And mm -hmm. uh, and Steve just got mercilessly beaten up for, oh, you think you know it all because you come from the Nimitz family. Let me let me show you this, show you that. Uh, but Steve Nimitz went on to be, a uh, Bill, you'll like this, a, um, a nuclear powered officer, not a submariner, but a nuke SWO. Um, commanded a destroyer, uh, made captain, had a marvelous, very successful career, um, lived up to that name in every way. But boy, I would not have wanted to walk through the gates of Annapolis with the last name Nimitz. <laughs> yeah. so, and Seth, you know, he studied the Pacific campaign mm -hmm. from long before the war, with War Plan Orange when he was at the right. War College and came up with the island hopping strategy right. that was really focused on you know making advances that were going to directly affect our ability to neutralize the, the empire of japan um and you know that sounds so obvious in retrospect but in 1941 42 there was a lot of machinations going on there was and i mean you know in our previous episode, Bill, we talked about MacArthur and 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 how MacArthur opposed the Central Pacific Drive and the island hopping campaign because it didn't focus on him. You know, let's be real. But but Nimitz was the architect of that drive, and that is if you look at just you know the forty thousand foot view of the Pacific War, the Central Pacific Drive is what won the war. It really mm -hmm. and truly is. And the island hopping campaign was designed to by Nimitz was designed to to believe it or not to avoid heavy casualties if at all possible to cut off japanese strategic and and, and important bases like truck and and places like that where they had you know huge amounts of of defensive forces and in order to get closer and closer and closer and closer to mainland japan to get them within range of our air power our strategic air power mm -hmm. and, and and assets like that and nimitz was the architect of that and that is how we fought the war and i don't he he really did push to find what he regarded as fighting admirals. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and, and Halsey had, we're going to do a future episode on Halsey. He had a lot of quirks. Quirk yeah. is a mild word for yeah. his personality disorder, but, but he was a fighting admiral and yeah. Nimitz recognized that and used him. And there were others, yeah. you know, well, Frank Jack yeah. Fletcher and others. Absolutely. And, and I would put um, quiet, Calm, professorial mm -hmm. Raymond Spruance, right at the Absolutely. top of the list. And, you know, I think anyone who studies this portion of the Admiralty, in the end, you're going to land on Team Halsey or Team Spruance. Mm -hmm. and, and as you guys know, they were kind of Nimitz masterfully played them as a, as a matched pair, mm -hmm. right. put one in, rest the other one. And Halsey really needed the rest. He was plagued with dermatitis, terrible mm -hmm physiological, mm -hmm. psychological challenges, spruance he could throw in. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm a team spruance kind of guy. I, I just think that uh, yeah, too. if there is anyone who, who deserved that fifth star um, it was more him. than, 
it, it would be Sperlin. So I, but I he himself that said, he that. So, yeah. if he would have got it in addition to Halsey, that would have been fine with him. But if he got it in lieu of Halsey, he wouldn't. Have, that wouldn't have sat right with him. Correct. But, you know that goes. Go, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that goes back to to Nimitz's, like you'd mentioned, you know, his his leadership ability, his leadership style, and the way he chose people and he chose his team. He put those guys in those positions at exactly the right times. Yeah. You know, Halsey was in charge of the carrier fleet, uh, carrier forces in February 42 with Enterprise, making them the hit and run raids, Marshall Islands, Wake, Marcus, and things like that. A, he was the most experienced carrier commander in the Pacific at the time, but B, he's also the exact type of leader that the pack fleet needed at that time and he knew that yeah. he knew that halsey was blood and thunder halsey was the headline guy even though yeah. eh. and, and and actually halsey's greatest contribution was morale was yeah. these these mm -hmm. flashy Absolutely. statements and this this persona you know i'm gonna ride tojo's white horse, horse down the <laughs> right. streets of tokyo right, and, right. And, and you know his his sailors loved him they oh, loved yeah. Halsey. It was very, very legitimate. In a way, they couldn't warm up to the sort of cerebral uh, spruance. But again, the, the genius of Nimitz is he could he could go back and forth. Um, as as we wrap up here, I want to I want to make one last point on the fleet admiral, and and that is um, we tend to overlook his two years as chief of naval operations. So he goes and he wins this. Um, galactic victory in the Pacific. And everyone, of course, wants him to be the chief of naval operations. And he says, okay, I'll do it, but only one two-year term, only mm -hmm. one two-year term. He caps himself, he term limits himself. It wasn't because he was tired or he didn't want to do, he, he felt like more, and, and there were subordinates to him and he needed to keep the flow going. He didn't want to clog the system up. And yet, as we alluded to a moment ago, it puts him in position on the train, equip, and organize side to, to bring all of these innovations to full flower. And of course, at the top of the list is the decision to go with nuclear power and, and right. to back Hyman Rickover, who is like the total opposite of Nimitz. Personality, absolutely. I mean, completely <laughs> different in every way. And um you know, back to back to the the one book I would recommend to people that that I've had a chance to write in terms of this conversation is called Sailing True North: Ten Admirals in the Voyage of Character, and the chapters on Nimitz and Rickover are right next to each other in the book. And I'll right. let others judge and argue and compare and contrast, but but their fates were incredibly intertwined and helped create the preeminence of the U.S. Navy in the 21st century. Pretty well, remarkable if you think about it. It is. And that's the perfect way to end the conversation. So I want to thank uh, thank the Admiral again, Admiral Stavridis, for joining us today. And it goes without saying that I do highly recommend his book, Sailing True North. I have it. It's a wonderful book where he profiles not just Admiral Nimitz, but nine other history-making admirals as well. Over to you, Seth. Uh, we want to thank you for, uh, well, first of all, let me get back to this. I want to thank you, Admiral, for being on our uh, program today. Sure. Uh, we're honored to have you and uh, much appreciated, much appreciated. Uh, but uh, we also want to thank you for listening to our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast and give us a rating and review. We would certainly appreciate it. Also, if you want a chance to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called The Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast. Uh, if you have a question, comment, or suggestion, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. And uh, once again, my name is Seth Paradin. I want to say thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, and thank you, Admiral Stavridis. And, uh, you know, it's been wonderful having you here today, and we'll see you next week. Sounds great, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.